Been wanting to say this in front of the team, but like, you know, since everything happened, been wanting to say this in front of the team, but like, you know, since everything happened back in August, man, I promise you, like, everybody in this room have like shown me unconditional love and support, man. Yeah. Like, yes, just sir. to help me get to this point for real, man. I couldn't be more thankful for everybody in this room, man. Y'all, people I turn to the most after going through what I went through, man, just, you know, to have this opportunity to do what I did today, man. I uh, give all y'all the credit, man. Thank y'all. Watch your football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. We are a day removed of Washington beating the Atlanta Falcons 19-13 to at home in a muddy contest. They now own the seventh wild card, uh, the seventh playoff spot, the wild card, last one that was added recently. <clears throat> But that being said, we are joined now by Sam Forty of the Washington Post to talk about this glorious evening. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing well. I appreciate y'all having me as always. Yeah, yes, sir. And look, that being said, from that game yesterday, is Brian Robinson coming into form? Sam, like, are we kind of seeing, because obviously the injury early on is kind of like him getting back to normal? I mean, if you listen to Brian and Ron Rivera, yes, this is sort of what they expected. He's getting up to speed. He's running real physical. If you listen to Robinson's teammates in the backfield, Jonathan Williams and Antonio Gibson, no, they think his ceiling is still pretty far away. They think that this is the type of guy that they can keep ascending, can you know have a little bit more explosive runs. I, I talked to um, Deami Brown about the third and one stretch run they ran left where he kind of hit that sideline, and Deami was like, man, if I'm going to go out there and make those blocks, like he's got to be faster. I need him scoring. I'm going to take him to uh, to some speed training in the off season. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. Now he's definitely starting to look like the, uh, the running back. We all started to fall in love with during the preseason. So definitely glad that he's uh, coming into form. Speaking of coming into form, it seems like Jamin Davis after Ron Rivera kind of called him out to the media and gave, kind of gave him that kick into the kick in the butt publicly. It seems like he's kind of upped his, his game to another level. How would you uh, assess his season so far and how he's been playing over the past month? The biggest indication to me that he has taken the step that they have wanted him to is after that first game without Cole Holcomb, where they gave, you know, Cam Curl the, the green dot to communicate with Jack Del Rio and become the play caller, they gave it to Jamin and he's had it since. And when you're talking about a guy that was struggling to handle the calls to uh, get everybody lined up and understand his assignment and play fast and fluid to unlock that athleticism that they love so much coming out of Kentucky. That, that to me is, is the biggest sign. I haven't gotten a chance to rewatch the defense yet from yesterday. I think that he might have not have played as well as he had in the last few games. Obviously when, you know, you're getting dominated like that up front, particularly in the first half, uh, I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a lot of the linebackers there because we saw some plays where they're running gap schemes and it just so happens that, you know, John Allen has three blockers and Deron Payne has two. So, you know, you can't expect more from those guys in that situation. But overall, I think let's not lose sight of the fact that the Jamin Davis has taken a really big step for them. Uh, Ron Rivera actually pointed out to me earlier this year that uh, that goal line stop in Indianapolis, he said that was a confidence call that Jack made to set Jamin up for that play mm -hmm. third and short down there on the goal line. And, and that was a massive play. So, so Jamin has taken big steps. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's and when, they gave him the green dot. It's not like Cam Curl did bad with it. Cam Curl, everybody was talking about how he did a masterful job. It's just so shout out to Jamin for still taking it and the defense not missing a beat. Somebody else who's been playing amazing has been Kendall Fuller, especially after the beginning of the season, the way that this started out. What has been different for Kendall? I mean, the dude just always seems to find himself around the ball. I think a part of it probably is is the pass rush even being coordinated and a little bit better because it helps him, right? Like he is a corner that is not the most athletic. You saw him lose some 50-50 balls in that first Philly game, but he is so instinctual. He's still good in zone. Like if, if he is is a solid part of, of a larger defense structurally, I think that that is how he wins. And you saw it, you know, in that pick sticks in Houston, he saw it on tape and, and he went out and executed. So to me, it, it's, it's more of a the pieces around him are, are playing better. So that allows him to, to play at his best. And I think that, um, you know, he talked to, to me earlier this year about coming into this year, injury free. This was one of the first off seasons. He felt like he wasn't dealing with something for, for weeks or months. And so 
I think you're seeing kind of a steady progress. He's held up better later in the year, I think, because he started a little bit ahead of where he had been in years past. Absolutely. And Sam, I alluded to it earlier, but Washington now holds the seventh playoff spot in the last wild card spot. Right now, if it ended today, they'd be facing against the Minnesota Vikings. That being said, how surprised are you that they are here? And now they have the playoff spot. Are they a viable playoff caliber team at this point? That's a really good question. And it's one that, you know, I've talked to some people on the beat about because I said in week five, I think after they lost to Tennessee, I was like, I don't know if this is going to implode and the wheels are going to come off and Ron's going to get fired or if this is a classic Ron Rivera season where they start slow. You're like, you know, is this even viable? And then they figure it out and and make a late push. And if everything breaks right, they're going to make the playoffs. So um, are they a viable playoff team right now? I'm going to say TBD. I think that the the run game right now is legit. Um, No one can question that. That's record in the NFL over the last seven games, Sam. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. (laughs) When they use 12 (laughs) and 13 personnel and they get the, like the tandem going, like they're so, so good, but I am not convinced that if a team were to come in and say, okay, we're making Taylor Heineke win with his arm that they can do that. And so until I see the passing offense step up, I'm not putting them down for, for being anything more than frisky in the wild card round. Mm Mm-hmm. Sometimes getting frisky is all that matters, though. You know what I'm saying? Ask <laughs> Kyle. Whoa. That's how I got my first child. You have, you're having another one, too, yeah, in the coming days. So. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so the offense, like you just mentioned, um, has definitely been uh, a little behind the – well, not a little. They've been behind the defense over the past couple games. Um, quarterback play, obviously, uh, could be better. Do you think that – kind of like the same question do you think going forward the quarterback play can be sustained and they keep winning or do you think this is a situation where if Carson Wentz somehow got injected back into this offense do you think the offense would look better or worse is pretty much my question this is this is a trap question man because I because no one can go against the Heineke magic like I feel like if you if you say that this offense will be better without Taylor Heineke right now people are are coming after you Mm. and and I and I do believe that right now the formula that got going the Jordans just do not do not touch it until it breaks. They're I'm 100% with that. But but I will say, there, I, I was just rewatching the offense before I came on with y'all, and like the seam throw that he's laid on to Bates in the red zone right before half, uh, the pick that he has, uh, the the throw that he, the comeback to Terry on the left side that that was almost picked but was overturned, like. The pick was one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life, too. That yeah. throw. It was like, come on, man. What are you I mean, <laughs> Why? it's like the deep crossers. Like, there's certainly things that he can do. And I think that, like, there's 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 a lot of plays that he can make with his head. But especially with how the offensive line is playing right now, if you put Carson Wentz back in there, I'm, the ceiling is higher with him. I, it, like, that's that's unquestionable. And, right. and so is that the right move? No. But if things were to break down the stretch and you go back to Carson Wentz, I, I, think, I think that this – raises the level of what they could be right it's almost one of those questions too where it's like would this would this team be rolling like this if Carson never got hurt like and would the ceiling be higher like because Carson nobody can argue Carson's more talent obviously Carson's more talented he's probably better quarterback than Taylor but for whatever reason these guys just seem to respond to Taylor so it's it's a weird situation but this defensive line man they've been so so good I know that they kind of got bullied a little bit uh early on in the run game but the way that they ended up ending that game and, and I mean, that second to last series where Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen and Montez Sweat just took over and kind of dominated. What are they doing different? What is going on with them? Because they are just playing peak football. Dude, the the whole thing is is the rush lane cohesion, rush lane discipline. They're running games. Uh, I tweeted out some clips after the Houston game, like a, like a whole thread basically of how they're different this year than last year. Last year, I mean, Ron Rivera was calling out on the team website, Chase Young and Montez Sweat for not trusting their teammates, for pressing too much. And this year you're starting to see them – um, just even play off each other, like what they call naturals, right? Like mm. there was a play in the Houston game where John Allen um, went into the left guard. Yeah. And, and the left tackle came down on him. And so he knew just based on how this play was unfolding, he had to drive outside to keep the quarterback contained. And Montez Sweat saw that and looped back around on like a natural stunt inside. So that maintains the integrity of the pocket and doesn't let the quarterback get out and run as we've seen them do when they do get undisciplined like that that Justin Fields run late in the Bears game. Montez I think was freelancing a little bit, came inside, left a big hole, Fields, you know, hits it and, and they win the game if Benjamin St. Juice doesn't make that play. But I think that the just the biggest difference is the playing together and uh 
you know, it sounds so football coach cliche, but when they're hunting together, like that makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> one thing I will say, I just had a sum on the top of my head, Sam, that you were referring to, and I thought you were perfect with that. So I didn't know that that was not a called stunt. I thought that was a natural play stunt. I didn't know that that was uh, basically they made up on their own on the fly, which is awesome to see. Mm -hmm. But to wrap this up, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you. The tight ends. Um, obviously, Logan Thomas had a great game last week. He didn't really get involved, but he did, what, did block his butt off, along with John Bates, obviously a touchdown catch. And Cole Turner got in the game, and I saw some of his blocks. He was phenomenal. So how are you looking at Coach Castillo? He deserves a game beer, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, the tight ends have, have been a huge part of this offense, increasingly so. The last three weeks, 12 and 13 personnel, I want to say these are among the highest rates we've seen Scott Turner use them in his tenure here. Um, and, and obviously, as you said, you know, they, they blocked pretty well. I think Logan, there are still some plays where, where I see him be a little bit slower. He gets some tougher blocks because of his pedigree, I think. But like there's one where he's coming that, that stretch run we we're talking about with Brian Robinson. He was a little bit, um, I think, slow down the line or maybe that was another run. But yeah, Cole Turner, when they use him on the move and then they ask him to block, like I think he's at his best there because he's undersized, you know, obviously still, you know, transitioning to the NFL, especially as a blocker, being a former receiver. But um, and, and John Bates, man, like <laughs> watching that dude block is a, is a privilege. Dude, like it's like another lineman. It's crazy. It, mm -hmm. He is. He is insane. Like there's a there's a there's a block where he comes back across the formation against the Colts that, that you guys should look at. It's like uh, like the, it's perfect timing. It's it's unbelievable. But yes, uh, that position group, particularly because like you thought this offense would be built around the receivers. Right. right. Like with how they went out and built it. Um but right now, with the running game, the tight ends have really played a huge part in that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know a lot of people have been asking about Jahan Dotson, but I think that you talking about that 13 personnel probably takes away those snaps from him. But my next question for you, Sam, is this special teams elite on both sides? I mean, my goodness, Atlanta, I think, was the best in the <coughs> NFL in punt return yardage. I think they averaged 17 per, which is the best in the NFL. This special teams has done a good job of limiting the big plays against them and have made some huge ones for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it, it was even notable to me because with Benjamin St. Jews out, Christian Holmes, who everybody in the locker room calls SIP, like he had to then step in and play corner, but he was still able, you know, like like to contribute in the special teams, was still able to maintain that level of play. I think Tress Way's punt, which which I think most people saw how yeah. it spun on the five yard line, like that dude is is balling. Uh he like he's I would argue he's probably the most beloved punter in the NFL. Dude, they're about um, to test him for steroids. I'm sure he's getting that call. <laughs> Um, and I will say that I think a guy who's really stood out to me, um, especially as like the pump protector is, is Jeremy Reeves. You know, that was DeShazer Everett for a long time, but he stepped in and, and I think been a really, uh, a really integral part of that unit in the locker room. Like uh, when, when the media come in, he, he, uh, he says that his nickname is all pro Revo and everybody should vote for him for all pro. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but, but certainly he's playing pretty well. Absolutely. Now my last question for you, Let's let's kind of talk about Chase Young. Uh, do you expect Chase Young to return this week against the Giants or possibly after the bye at home versus the Giants? Uh, I've, I've actually taken a vow of not predicting whether Chase Young will mm -hmm. play anymore uh, <laughs> because I, because I've been wrong so many times. Uh, but I, I maybe like that's what we've heard from Chase Young. You know, obviously he's getting over the illness that that contributed to him not playing this week. Um, it'll be tough because you know MetLife Stadium is is turf um not grass and and when washington's gone inside uh to practice during during rain in the past few weeks they haven't put chase young out there because they want to be careful with his knee but i mean you, you gotta you gotta play at some point right yeah um and so to me like the biggest question with chase young other than does he still look like a guy capable of being that dude is does he affect the rush lane discipline that we've talked about you know mm -hmm. like that's the reason they're playing so well right now. And that's a guy who has regularly freelanced in the past. Um, is he capable of coming back and not disrupting that? I think that's a huge question. And obviously when you have a player of his talent, you, you do whatever you can to make it work with him. And I think, you know, he's probably a net positive on the field, but there is that risk. There is, there absolutely yeah. is, but we're all excited to see the predator come back and get back into form, baby. Sam can't thank you enough, sir. This was a great victorious day. Appreciate your time as always, brother. I hope you have a good night. Of course. Thanks, guys. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Sam. All right, everybody. We just joined by the man, Mr. Sam Forty of the Washington Post. My man. Yeah. I... What's a little known fact, a lot of people don't know this. Uh, Sam actually 
that hat that Sam was wearing was actually one of Brian Robinson's, the big ones that he wore after the game. It's just <laughs> Sam's head so big it fit into it. Well, so when, that you're was... that, when you're that smart, Reed, that's just natural. That's what I'm saying, man. What happened? Great head. But mm-hmm. now we are joined by our next guest. This guy, this time from Pro Football Focus, Mr. Nick Acreage, our fo- our favorite for PFF, but our second favorite. I'll say that. Or, you're tied for first. How about that? What's up? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I'd I say know, I might have, I might have to leave now. No, we got, we, got, we got Steve Manila coming on next. It's the only reason why I caught myself because I know he's going to hear okay, this. Okay. Yeah. Steve, <laughs> Steve's a good guy. I'll, I'll out. I'll out. <laughs> My man. Uh, if you can, real quick, I know I'm not sure if you've been able to watch the entire game back. Um, obviously, you being a Commanders fan, looking over this team in detail. Looking back at this game from yesterday, who are the four biggest, um, the highest of the pro football focus ratings from yesterday? Yeah, um, we had Cornelius Lucas, Brian Robinson Jr., um, Kendall Fuller, and then I think right behind them um, was Jonathan Allen or Cam Curl, I think one of those two. The um, lower lower yeah. grades um, than usual, but that kind of makes sense if you were watching the game. They were kind of getting gashed on defense. I, again, another week, I have no idea how they won that game, but they <laughs> they keep doing it, and it's – I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to go with the flow. And if it all comes crashing down, then then we can start to question it. But right now, it's just fun. Yeah, absolutely. And speak of like, talk to me about Cornelius Lucas. What did you see from him? Uh, that's surprising to hear, but I'm glad that he had a great game. Because uh, like, he, he didn't seem to form the past couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been weird. They've been rotating him and Cosmian by quarters um, the past two weeks. They've done Lucas gets the first and third quarters. Cosme gets second and fourth. And if a drive kind of overlaps into the quarter, they'll let them stay there. Uh, but this week they switched it. Cosme at first and third, Lucas second and fourth. It's weird, but it's working. Um, okay. Both of them have seen to play well. Is that normal? No, I've never seen a team do that. No. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, some they'll do it. They'll do it a lot if like a guy is coming back from injury. But it's right. been like this has it's been, been three weeks before. in a row. I thought right. they were doing it because Cosme was a little still a little to get hurt. Up to but, speed, right? Yeah, but it's three weeks in a row. It's 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 working so. Yeah. There's no reason to stop it. I think the two of them have honestly really been the best offensive linemen um, when they're each in. So, yeah, it's it's weird. It's working. They're both – Cornelius Lucas's run blocking grade has kind of been surprising to me. Mm. Um, he's not usually known as a, a big kind of run blocker. That's usually where Cosme specializes in. But he's been really good there these past couple of weeks. And, yeah, the two of them have just seemed to work. Paul, you got yeah. something? Yes. Yeah, uh, speaking of working, it seemed like you mentioned the uh, the running game for Atlanta yesterday. Uh, they were getting gassed up front. They were getting gassed for a decent chunk uh, rushes by Patterson and the other dude that I can't say his last name. I think it's like Algeria or something like that. Yeah, Al- <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah. So Algeria, do you, yeah. yeah, Algeria. Yeah, that's his name. Um, <laughs> do you think that is a sign of things to come going up against a team like the Giants who? like to run the ball out with Saquon Barkley, use Daniel Jones in the running game? Or do you think that's just a one-off and the defense will get back to form going into the New York next week? I think it's more of a one-off situation because Atlanta's run game is more unique than a lot of other teams. They're running a lot of read option. I mean, t- or the Titans, very run heavy. They didn't get as gashed like they did right. th- this past game. Like, But the Titans is more just kind of man, duo blocks, Derrick Henry coming right down your throat. This was read option, oh, yeah. Mariota, <laughs> and it was it was a problem. The two linebackers struggled. This was the worst I've seen Jamin Davis this year. Mm. Um, after we've all kind of been praising him because he'd been playing pretty well, but this was bad. It, it kind of looked like Jamin Davis last year. He just he didn't make any decisions. Like every every time he was kind of late to react, just jumping out of gaps, making it way too easy for people to pick up on him. And yeah, it was bad. And John Bostic was. John Bostic. So, um, yeah, it was rough from the linebackers. Very, very rough. Yeah, Nick, you got a great head of hair. Anybody ever tell you that? Appreciate that. that. It's, my, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. My barber said it's thinning up at the top. So. Really? I think you're he's a hairline lying king. To you. He's yeah. lying. I'll tell you, <laughs> from somebody who has thinning hair, he's lying. Yeah, to you. But I will say, yeah. Jamin Davis was second on the team in tackles yesterday. So that, that is good to see that he at least is showing the consistency with the tackles without Cole. I will yeah. say. That. I would yeah. argue that that shows that tackles is a very meaningless stat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. you just offended every old school football fan. Oh, I know they the, hate it. They Mark hate Tyler's going to be in your DMs in a second. Um, they hate it. So, uh, what? So one of our favorite players, Derek Forrest. Derek Forrest mm-hmm. has been tearing it up. Derek Forrest was an alpha dog yesterday. At least. 
from the casual fan. You know, what I saw out there, Derek Forrest was suplexing people. He he, he gave he a the team spine, tackles. Yeah, he gave a spine buster out there at one point. What <laughs> what, what can you what have you seen from Derek Forrest? Well, usually when you're leading the team in tackles and you're playing safety, it's not the greatest thing. That usually means A, your linebackers aren't playing well, your defensive line isn't playing well, or B, you're giving up a lot of receptions. Um, he was okay. I wouldn't say it was one of his best games. We're not grading big hits highly. Like, I mean, he had big hits, but it was after first downs and stuff. Like, so we're not going to grade that highly just because it was a, a big hit. That's cool to see as a fan and whatnot. But uh, from a, like a football standpoint, it's, it's just another, another tackle. Like I, we just want to see you make the tackle. A um, couple moments of some coverages. He not blue, but he knew where he was supposed to be. Just kind of messing them up here and uh, here and there. But I mean, it was a, it was an okay game. It wasn't, you know, what we've sort of come to expect from him, which is, you know, really great safety play. It was a pretty decent game. Um, you know, just struggled a little bit. They did move him down into the box in the second half, I believe. They had Bobby McCain in there, and that was rough. Yeah, it was like rough me, for McCain. Derek he just he, loves getting in the box. Just yeah, like me. McCain just is not built for sitting in the box, and right. that's what you need to do if you're playing slot and then against these run heavy teams. So they moved him back down into the box the second half, I believe, and it, it was a lot better. And now, to Nick, to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you. I know you're a very busy man. Um, but I, you talked about the RPO with Atlanta, them being very unique in that aspect. But if I'm New York, who has a similar type of quarterback in Daniel Jones, wouldn't you mimic that read option if it was so important and u- useful to an extent? So my concern, my question to you, are you concerned at all about the effectiveness of that RPO yesterday moving forward? Yeah, I, I mean, we've seen Daniel Jones kill us in the past. Like uh, just the white Mike Vick, like everyone calls him. Vanilla Vic. That's what he turned into when he plays Washington. It's very, very weird. Um, it's the only team he seems to really just kind of torch. Um, the read option definitely helps. Uh, you have him and Saquon, and it's it's kind of a scary combo when they're running the ball well. Um, I, I have no idea what to expect in these next two games. It's going to be so weird playing the Giants technically or not technically back-to-back, but it is sort of back-to-back. Um it's just going to come down to just whoever gets luckier. Like these two teams have been, the Giants had their crazy lucky streak at the beginning. It's kind of starting to wear off. Washington is on their lucky winning streak right now. I know some people don't like the word luck, but it's good to be lucky. It's very, very good to be lucky. You want to be lucky. Um, I'll take all that luck, man. Take it because I'll I mean, again, I can get. exactly. Yeah. Like it came down. We all thought Falcons were going to score there. Like they're setting up, they're right. wasting the yeah. clock. And you get a you get a batted pass. That wasn't luck. That was a good job by Deron Payne. And it just but it's lucky that it just kind hand of, up. You know, of course, left hand was always <laughs> all, left hand is always up. Um, but it's just it's just a lucky bounce that falls your way, and, and you need these sort of things to happen. It's why you're on a win streak like this. But eventually, that luck will run out. I don't want it to. None of us do. It will run out, and you're going to need a quarterback to step up. You're going to need your defense to step up, and you know, hopefully, we can just kind of get the lucky bounces against the Giants because these are two massive, massive games. Yeah, you're not always going to have the spirit of Sean Taylor in that end zone to help deflect that pass for you like was there yesterday. I saw it. Very, very <laughs> true nice. and good yeah. point. Um, <clears throat> we're about to give out our game beers for the game yesterday, Nick. So what's one player, one entity that deserves the game beer for their hard work yesterday? The kick their feet up tonight just for a short moment of time. Relax, drink a beer, then get back to work. I'd say Kendall Fuller. I think outside of the pick, which was it was a good diving catch, I think he was really good yesterday. Um, the Falcons don't throw the ball a ton, but when he was targeted, he was he was in a good position. So I'd go Kendall Fuller. Um, yeah, it was a it was a weird game. I, I don't know if anyone really played outstanding. Like right. no one's yelling at me saying Jonathan Allen to run Payne must have a higher grade. No one's really yelling at me for that. We <laughs> saw that they were getting kind of gashed inside. Were. Um, so yeah, no, I, I'd go Kendall Fuller. And he's been playing really, really well for like the past like six, seven weeks. It's Have kind of you, impressive. Is there yeah. any like easy identifiers as to why that's the case in your opinion? No, I, I'd have to I'd have to look further into it. Um, my guess, just on the surface, is no, just kind of going back to what they've done this past couple of years of just sitting in off zone coverage, two high shells. Yeah, and it's what he's best at. It's what he's always been best at. Um, you don't have the not the threat, but you don't have to try to constantly play press man when you have Will, William Jackson out there. Um, so that's that's my thought. Uh, I'd have to dive more into it. But, yeah, when Kenneth Fuller's playing off and he can kind of read routes and match him up, he's he's at his best. Wholeheartedly, yeah. totally that freaking agree. Falcons' run game is so good. 
it's really nasty. Is. They have so many pieces. They are, and their offense is legit. Uh, it's just their defense was lower ranked, but this was a very it's even. Just they have Marcus Mariota. <clears throat> yeah, it's an even, it was a very do? even team, even game, I thought, and uh, Washington came out on top. Nick, I can't thank you enough for joining us on this Victory Monday, sir. It's awesome to be able to speak with you, get your thoughts on it. Uh, just before you get out of here, would you like to plug your social media handle, just in case anybody watching would like to come follow you and hasn't yet? Yeah, uh, it's just PFF or at PFF underscore Nick Ackridge. Um, and I just realized that my Zoom thing says Michelle Ackridge, it which does. is my wife. I didn't want to tell you. I thought um, that so was shout out prior. Yeah. No, I, shout out to my shout I out to my wife. Judging. I maybe there I thought go. something was coming down. I didn't know. You know, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, I'm not one to judge. She's 2022, dude. We don't care. A couple weeks ago. <laughs> I swear. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all yeah. right, Nick. Have a good night. Bro. <laughs> Left hand up. It. See you guys. Yeah. Left hand up, brother. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Nick Acreage. I love having Nick on because it's just a fun, easy but time. On. Dude, greatest hairline. Great hairline. All right, Good for now, him. Let's, uh, before we are joined by our next guest, let's do our game beers very fast. Then we'll do fan questions because we have a lot of them. So that we want to get through them and give everybody the respect of that. So, Reed, game beers. Who's the one player or entity that's getting your game beer? Uh, oh, this is a tough one. Uh, I am going to go with the easy, it's easy, but Brian Robinson, man, shout out to Brian Robinson. Of course, he got the game ball, but rushing for over a hundred yards for the first time in his career and just alpha dog, man. It seemed like every time he got the ball, him just going forward, he wouldn't be denied. And then on that touchdown reception where he trucked that Falcons player and just knocked him back to two weeks ago, I think it was, it was fantastic. Shout out to his family. Yep. Dude, he's this little young Derrick Henry, as I like to say, who's getting my game beer. None other than Ron Rivera himself. Um, I think he deserves it. I think this team won this game based on the structure and what he's built here. And so that that game was won based on how he's built this team. And I think that he deserves a game beer, given the fact of how much crap he has gone through this entire time. Uh, so for me, Ron Rivera, kick up your feet, sir. I'm sure you're not going to drink. <clears throat> drink the root beer, whatever it is. Enjoy it. He's a big wine guy, so he'll probably have a glass uh, of wine. Yeah. Probably used to be a beer uh, guy though. He looks like he did. He looks like a like a classy wine guy. Yeah. Uh, I'll go with the not Martha's one person, Vineyard. but the that's like a classy wine, right? Martha's Vineyard. I was gonna say like uh, the you one that's it. in the box that you slap. Franzia, that's pretty classy. But uh, oh, slap, yeah. slap of the bag, slap of the bag. Um, only degenerates know about that. Yeah. Slap in the bag, man. <laughs> I'll go bag. with the entire tight end group now. Yes. If you said, Mike, what? They didn't have, like, look at the stats. Only John Bates had four catches for 24 yards and a touchdown. Logan Thomas had, like, one catch for, like, five or ten yards. But if you watched the game, you would have saw how important were they were in the running game, how important they were for Brian Robinson to get his first career 100-yard game. And, like I said, John Bates contributing into the passing game and scoring a touchdown. Always deserves a game beer for that. So, uh, yeah, the entire tight end group, kick your feet up and – Choke, 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 choke. And uh, real quick, I just wanted to say before you said, uh, Reed, Brian Robinson, 18 carries, 105 yards, two receptions, 20 yards, and a touchdown, average 5.8 on the ground. Yeah. Disgusting. The, fa the fact that Washington can find a way to win against a borderline playoff team. I mean, the Falcons are in the running. They're playing very good. We they're took good them running. out of yeah. it. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, they're still in it. They can well, still, yeah, yeah. Like, but you yeah, know what but, I mean. We heard their yeah, chances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but – the fact that they could still find a way to win when their bread and butter, their defense, their defensive line specifically was getting dominated early on and just it took them a while to get going. The fact that they can still find a formula to win, I think really says a lot about this team. They're a lot better than people are giving them credit for. Absolutely. Left hand up, baby. Woo! Now let's go to our fan question. This is from Tim Towner. Other than dead money, it seems that Ron Rivera has the roster in pretty good shape, but injuries can still occur and we have five games left. And it also seems that Philadelphia is signing a former All-Pro every week. As good as our depth may seem, what position or positions would benefit most by bringing in some help at the point this year? At this point this year. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, for me, Tim. Uh, for me, Tim, I think it's either a defensive back or linebacker at this moment because of Cole Holcomb going on IR. I am concerned that teams are going to see that they can double and triple team John Allen and Deron Payne like Atlanta did, and you can have good success on the ground by doing that. So I um, I am concerned about the run gaps, the run fills, if that's the case uh, moving forward. So for me, it's linebacker DB, just given with the injuries. Uh, no disrespect to Christian Holmes. He, did, he was serviceable in his first start, but he was getting picked on. I'll say uh, O-line, just because you can never have too much O-line depth. 
um, especially like nowadays and with the with the many times they've run the ball. Wes Schweitzer's practicing again. Yeah, with the aggression that they run the ball, I mean, it's bound to happen at some point. Knock on wood that the injury is going to come up at some point. Just, I mean, those guys are big human mountains moving, uh, running on the field. So uh, it's never, never a bad thing to have O line depth. Yeah, I'm I'm right, I'm right there with both of you guys. I think but all those are important. And I guess this linebacker, like you said, I think would probably be the biggest one with Cole Holcomb and uh, Jamie Davis. But I do think that they like being able to bring an extra safety in. Uh, so maybe not. But I mean, if something happens to, uh, you know, the, the, any uh, more of these linebackers are going to have to bring somebody else in because they just don't have the bodies. They don't have the bodies. No, thank you, Tim. That was a great question. This next question is from Meese21, Brandon Reinbold in the Discord chat server. Thank you, Brandon. He says there's a lot of negative reviews on the Sean Taylor Memorial. However, Sean's daughter Jackie seemed to like it from the videos I've seen. What are your thoughts on the memorial? Did the front office get this time or did it get it right this time around? It seems like the majority of the fan base will complain regardless of what we've done. I I'll take this one first, sir. <laughs> I'm guilty of it too, man. I saw that I first saw that and I was like that looks like it's at Dick's Sporting Goods and they forgot to put it there, but everybody was crapping on it. Then you learn that the Taylors are the ones who kind of why they did everything and that it was important to them. And Jackie, she was I, everybody was making fun of Reebok pants, Nike jersey, soccer cleats on. Jackie said that the soccer cleats were the most important to her. She was crying about it because it meant so much to her and her family. And I, I think it was a lot better that everybody wants to overreact to everything and everybody wants to say that everything that we do is bad and terrible. But if you look at it, man, that this was important to the Taylors. They did everything for a reason. And, hey, we're going to get a new stadium soon. you got to be able to bring this with us. So uh, let's not put a 50-ton statue somewhere at the, this moment. But, hey, I mean, it was I was disappointed. But the more I learn about it, everybody needs to calm down. It's all right. Yeah, I've seen words like disgrace, embarrassment, other things to describe the memorial. And, honestly, it makes me sick to my stomach. I think it's ridiculous. I think if you were to say that to Sean Taylor's face, he'd probably laugh at you. And he'd say, you care more about this than I do. I said it on Twitter yesterday. Do you think Sean Taylor cared about what he wore in his uniform? Dude went bare knuckle most times. He would play naked if he had the ability to. He just loved to play football. And y'all are sitting here complaining about soccer cleats, Reebok jerseys. Who cares, dude? Like, are you? is that all you do with your life? This is about remembering Sean. And we're sitting here arguing about what he, what his... A mannequin is dressed as and what is mannequin what does that matter it's about remembering Sean and the fact is all these people talking crap because they feel like they have the power to talk crap about this team any decision anything that they do they feel that I don't know they feel some sort of um joy from it a relief I'm not really sure how to explain it but it's almost like they're taking their pain out on the team fact is you're doing it to Sean's daughter she's the one who designed all of it the reason why it's see-through is because she said that she wanted to emulate the emptiness that they've felt since Sean's passing so good job, everybody. You made yourself look like a gigantic asshole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, I'm pretty much with you guys. Uh, I was, I'm actually had the same reaction as Reed. When I first saw it, I was kind of like, that's it? Like, mm, it just looks like a bunch of wires with like a jersey and like some cleats on it and a helmet. But obviously once you like dig deeper into like, what the or what the memorial was, and everyone made a big thing about it. It's not a statue. That's supposed to be a statue. Only a couple of people in the media said it would be a statue. Yep. The team never said it would be a statue. Yeah, they said it would be a Sean Taylor memorial. They said people they, just assumed it would be a statue yep. and ran with the whole statue idea. So that's I feel like why people were oh that's a disgrace and that's re disrespectful and blah blah blah. Well, it's only disrespectful and disgraceful in your mind because you already had something. Right. pre-planning your mind that you thought it would be and it didn't turn out to what you wanted like, it to be imagine saying something is embarrassing and disgraceful that doesn't impact you at all like you're not the person that they're doing it to. like you're saying that sean would be embarrassed and disgraced by this like who are you to have that power exactly you know what i'm saying but at, at, like you said yeah. at the end of the day whenever they interviewed his daughter and she was saying like she was crying saying how much she loved it she liked it she was like you said especially the cleats because i mean if you go back and watch Sean Taylor's game, he did wear soccer cleats during the game. You just couldn't tell because they were always taped up. Right. So, and then obviously, of course, the Twitter mob backtrack saying, well, if the Taylors like it, then yeah, I like it too. And so, I don't know, it's again, like you said, Kyle, it's just uh, people, some people like, like to crap on this team and get on the team. And look, when they do something bad, call them out for it. Cool. But I just feel like people nitpick so much. And they just, like you said, 
they get some type of like satisfaction and joy of being like a Twitter troll, like, hey, yeah, I'm trolling the team. Yeah. But in reality, you're just making yourself kind of look like a weirdo. So And honestly, you're crapping on Sean Taylor's family who work exactly. hard on it and care about it. Yeah. And obviously if if she plays soccer and that's her connection to her dad is through the game of soccer. Then who are you like, to say that it's stupid? Right. Exactly. exactly. And that's uh-huh. my whole point. And look, that's why I love you too. But this next question is from Tony Shivers Hall. Love you too, Dad. Thoughts on the O-line play. Even when everyone knew we were going to run, they still got it done. And Taylor had a clean pocket for most part in passing situations. Also, any insight on why they rotate Lucas and Cosme at right tackle? Dude, <laughs> Tony is on it, bro. Yeah, know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to work backwards, uh, like we just talked about a little bit ago with Nick. Um, we don't know why they're rotating him, but, I mean, if it's working, cool. If it's broken, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So, if that's how they want to keep rotating the line, if they, if they feel like they get the best out of the offensive line by rotating those guys in and letting both of them play, then I guess I'm all for it. Um, the running game, obviously, Brian Robinson did his thing yesterday, first career 100 yard game. I would say that the offensive uh, line. Big Hat Bob. That's his name. Yeah. Big Hat, <laughs> Big Bob. hat uh-huh. Bob. I like that. Big Hat Bob. Um, I would say that that's the offensive cool. line has transformed to what it was at the beginning of the season, mostly because outside of like Cosme and Lucas rotating in like every other quarter. It's the same guys that have been in there. They're uh, starting to gel together. Obviously one of the biggest things with offensive linemen is all five guys got to be able to gel together, play together, play in sync. And I feel like they're finally doing that. And with Brian Robinson coming to life um, and Taylor not taking as many sacks, the pocket being a little bit cleaner the last couple of weeks, obviously we're playing the Texans and the Falcons. So they're not big defensive linemen teams. But with that being said, I just feel like overall the offense, if they could just take it up to like two more gears, one or two more gears, basically in the passing game, I just feel like this team would be just a serious, serious threat. But for right now, they're doing their thing, and the biggest thing is winning. So if they're winning, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. as long as Taylor's not taking more sacks than Kyle on a weekend night, <laughs> I am all good. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, I, I love the O-line play thus far. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've watched this football team play, and when they run the football, it just runs into a brick wall. And we're sitting here saying, why don't we run the football more? Why are we only th- – because we can't run the ball. For the first time, you're seeing a sustainable and consistent inflicting of will upon the opposing team. And I think Ron Rivera had a quote, I think, to J.P. Finley, and talking about the new era of the, the smaller, thinner defensive linemen that are fast, shifty guys, where you can wear them down throughout the game with these runners and with Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson. And I think he's absolutely right about that because that's what's happening. I think the tight ends have a lot to do with it as well. But credit to my boy Tyler Larson. Uh, Andrew Norwell, I know that he was piled on early on in the season, but he has continued to fight and work hard. And he has done a great job thus far. And then Trey Turner trying to battle injuries, trying to do well. And then Cornelius Lucas, Sam Cosby, that rotation. Dude, I love unconventional stuff like that. If, yeah. if it works, it works. Do it, bro. I love yeah. it. Yeah, that's the thing with, with that whole rotation. Like uh, like Nick talked about, They usually that's something you'll see for the first game of players coming back from injury. And that's kind of what I'm loving about this coaching staff right now. When something's working, they're not touching. They're not going to mess with it. They're like, hey, go ahead. Do do you. We're going to keep doing that. And I'm all about that because I'm a very superstitious person. So, like, I love that for us. I absolutely love that for us. Now, this next question is Orange Crush 92, Reed. How's your prediction from the beginning of the season holding up? Hmm, actually, hey, we're on – pace man we we could easily finish right right there around that win threshold that we talked about uh and who would have thought after week five you know we're sitting there what what are we one and four and we're like our season's over Let's turn it after week three we were saying that. week two three we were saying that but now all of a sudden best record in the nfl over the last seven games hey and guess what old heart old heart attack heineke's back there doing just what he can to keep us in position and this defense We got Big Hat Rob. I think we can – this has shades of the defense from two years ago with the old Big Hat Rob taking on the Sheriff going to get your role with Clinton Portis from back in the day, and I'm all here for it. I love it. Let's just ride (laughs) these coattails, baby. What a plug, dude. What a plug. Um, I I agree with you uh, for the most part. I think that – I think my prediction is pretty spot on, to be perfectly honest with you. It, the, the season has mapped out how I thought it would. I didn't think that they were going to go 2-0. and I did think they were going to beat the Jags or Lions. I just didn't know which one it was going to be. I thought that this is 
honestly, because I've always said this, when you start the season, you never end the season as the same team. Something happens. You transition, you transform into the end of the season. And what you try to have to do is the next following season is replicate what you're doing at the end of that <laughs> last season, continuing that momentum, but it's hard to do that. So you Swag. have to be able to morph into that. And I feel like that's what they're doing now, uh, to be, be honest. And I think seven and five, I think I was probably north of that. I was probably at like nine and three or something or, or eight and four. So I'm not far off. But um, I, I think that they can they can make it do, man. I I want to keep winning, bro. This this is awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't really remember like as far as like week by week what I picked, like win loss, win loss, and whatnot. But I had this team at ten wins, and after week five, that would have been you would have been like ten wins. <laughs> you smoke crack. That's impossible. <laughs> but here we are, uh, seven weeks later. What it is? It's seven weeks later. Six and one, best record in the NFL since week six. Again, we don't know how – I mean, outside of the defense and the running game, which the defense is definitely playoff and championship contender worthy. The running game is playoff and championship contender worthy. The defense is playing – I think I already said defense. But just the offense and the passing game, the quarterback play. If they, Like I said, if they can just kick it up one or two more gears, this team can uh, really do some things and uh, hopefully – they just keep the train rolling on to New York. Yeah, look, Taylor, 14 of 23, 138 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. He made some crucial throws. But that that accuracy, 14 of 23, you know, I, I need to see that elevated, just too inaccurate. Obviously, it was very rainy yesterday. You know, give him credit, but I just want to put that stat in there. I saw this I saw this tweet that uh, Matthew Paris, friend of the show, Matthew Paris, put out there earlier and he was like doing some deep diving looking back at Ron and his Carolina years and the 2013 year and his third year there when they went on that run and uh they were uh I think same same record through 12 games seven and five weirdly enough they're averaging the same amount of yards per game mm. as Washington is right now Damn. in offense even when the Cam defense, Newton was that quarterback yeah holy yeah. crap the defense is like uh like top five in the league or whatever it is, just like they were in Carolina. So it's weirdly, weirdly, and strangely the same. Look I at the told NFL, you, man. Look Remember at, when at, you said I saw the light earlier? Look Remember? at NFL's Twitter header. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's sick. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe they put that as their Twitter head for the NFL uh, actual <laughs> account. Last question, the Discord chat server from our guy, Aki G. Question for the pod. How does John Bates stack up against our past our pass blocking and receiving tight ends? For me, I'd say he's on the road to becoming a better version of Logan Paulson. No offense to Logan, of course. <laughs> hey, I think Logan would love to be half the player John Bates is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dude. Uh, <laughs> um, no, John Bates, man, he's good all around. And that's I think that's the reason that we like him because he's a very good blocker. And, hey, he can catch the ball when he needs to. And, uh, yeah, I think Logan – I think that's why Logan liked him so much coming out. And he said he reminds me of myself as a young buck. And then he started talking about how he started calling him a caveman and stuff. And I was just like, Logan, chill. <laughs> so, dude. hopefully, yeah. No, dude, uh, I will say – Logan – Look, a lot of people made fun of me because I used to say Logan Paulson was very pivotal and important to the 2012 playoff run. I still say that to this day. He made the right catches that he needed to. My poor Logan, man. Give my man some friend. credit. My God. But he now, made my favorite play in Washington that season when RG3 against but, the Giants escaped and threw it on fourth. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, hey, we're now joined by our like next guest, play. Mr. Steve Manila of PFF, our favorite guy from PFF behind Nick Nick Acreage. Actually, you know, you guys are tied. No, yeah, but, no. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hey, What's Steve, up, man? It's good to talk to you, brother. Uh, real quick, if you just want to answer this question for us from Aki G, how do you stack up John Bates against the other pass blocking receiving tight ends? He thinks that he's possibly going to be like more like a Logan Paulson type of tight end. Honestly, that's a great comparison. That I, is I just really caught good. that. Yeah, I just caught that last bit, and I was wondering who the heck you were talking about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I like that comparison. Uh, Bates has done a good job. I mean, uh, I would like to see him get a little bit more opportunities, but I know, I know, you know, and. It's just kind of the way they run the offense now. But uh, he's done a good job blocking. And, and hey, if this run game continues to do what they can do and have been doing, I think I think we'll be all right. I, I actually like the formula a lot right now. It, it looks like it's an old school NFC East, smack you in the mouth, you know, and I like it. So yeah, why so not? It's simple yet effective. It's just right. throwback it football, man. It's playoff football that you used to see. Play tough defense and just ram it down their throat like Kyle on a Thursday night when he's out with the boys. <laughs> you're gonna run that. You're gonna run that joke into the ground by the end of this episode. He will. Uh, Steve, Your head's getting it? run into the ground when that guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Norm, leave me alone. <laughs> this next question, from, uh, Steve, I'm going to go to you. This is from our guy, the Colonel. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. He, his question is, our only loss in the last seven games was a three-point nail-biter to the Vikings. Am I being too optimistic, thinking that no, not only can we make the playoffs, but possibly even get a playoff win? It's a great question. Uh, we honestly should have won that game. There's two two big plays, right? We all remember yep. the awful interception from Heineke that really changed the momentum. And then the, the, it was a bad PI call on, on St. Juice, but you know, whatever, you can't blame the refs. Uh, so it was such a close game. Um, I, I think that if we played them again, I know it'd obviously be in Minnesota, but if we played them again, uh, I, I think they could definitely compete with them. It all depends on Heineke and it would really depend on cousins. We all know cousins, really well obviously so if he's on fire it, it's tough to stop that offense so I, I could see it happening I don't really want to play them the first week though yeah. but uh you know they got a lot of weapons man they're fun to watch so uh, and I would hate for Kirk to send us home in the playoffs that'd be like a, just a bitter you know so but good question so if we hold on to the playoffs Colonel all I'll ask is that they schedule the Vikings playoff matchup with Washington if it turns prime that way on prime time Please yes. make it at 8 o'clock at night, please. <laughs> Do not give w. me 1 p.m. Kirk yeah. Cousins anymore pulling rabbits out of his hat. Insane stuff and I if, saw him throw on that If game. that happens, you guys all need to go pick uh, Benjamin St. Juice and Kendall Fuller to each be good for two picks. Put like $20 down. You'll yeah. make so much money. I swear <laughs> to God, Kirk will throw and, it to him. And, him. Colonel, I don't – honestly, the, I'll say this as just like my personal belief. Like because I try to learn from the 2012 season. It went by so fast, like just trying to enjoy the ride. So yep. we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of games. Let's just enjoy where we are right now. They're seven and five. This is not a place that we generally are at this point in the year. Let's just enjoy where we're at at the moment. Uh, what do you guys say? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm with you. First time we've been two games over 500 since six and four. Alex Smith before he literally almost died on the field. <laughs> so, yeah, like you said, just enjoy the ride. Um, I don't want to look too, like you said, I don't want to look too far ahead because. Just like the players, as a fan, I just want to take it one game at a time. Right. I don't even think I could be able to look far ahead because I'm almost about to have a heart attack every single game anyway. <laughs> if I look further down the road, I might actually literally die. So, <laughs> yeah, I just want to. I just want them to take it one game at a time and just keep the run game going, keep the defense nice, and keep the defense stout, playing hard, and we'll just see what happens at the end of four quarters. Absolutely. Now, Steve, yeah. this next question is from Tony Franchise on Twitter. Read. I'm going to go to you after Steve. He, he asks, good win yesterday, but how sustainable is it for us to keep having these close games because the cardiac commanders have been having us on edge? <laughs> yeah, uh, th that one was really close yesterday, guys. Uh, if Atlanta scores on that, I, I don't know. I don't think we're going to drive down the field and kick a field goal. That'd be tough. Uh, so it, it's been really crazy. The Eagle game was awesome, especially the way it ended. Uh, usually we're on the other end of that. So that, that was great. The Colts game was nuts, um, you know, so it, it, they've all been really close. Even the Bears, you know, we, we were on this uh, right before the Bears game. And uh, heck, at that time, we were one and four. I'm thinking yeah, the, the, it's over. The yeah. And that started. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, us, us four have the good luck charm for the team. Yeah. So hey, here we go, Steve. Let's go yeah. that. Bring that. All right. Yeah. Bring that in the atmosphere. That. I need that hell uh, versus New York. What do you think, Reed? Yep. Yeah, no, I'm right there. I mean, that's. It, Oh, heart attack Heineke. This is just a kind of this is the kind of football that you get with them. But uh they're every game's close. And look, just last week when we beat the Texans, we finally beat somebody comfortably. And it was like, all right, ooh, we can breathe a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, the Eagles game started out rough, but then it got a little better as it went on. But this happens in the NFL, man. And hey, I'm here for it. I'm here for the ride. And if I have a heart attack, I really don't care. As long as it happens <laughs> after the Super Bowl. I don't care. Now, this next question, Steve, I want to go to you. This is right up your alley. Obviously, you're known on Twitter as the quarterback guru. This question is from Deuce, Red Zone in the Lab. Appreciate you, Deuce. Always catch him in the Twitter spaces, and he's a really good dude. Would you rather lose the next two games so Taylor Heineke can be benched or win and stay with Heineke? I never want to lose. So, <laughs> the, it, it, I mean, I don't care if it's freaking coaching youth football, the – high school to college, whatever, I would never want to lose. So that's a crazy question. Uh, I would love to see Sam Howe eventually. I know we all would. Um, we know what Heineke is now. And, um, yeah, he's not been very good. And that's that's definitely the truth. But um, they're winning. They're winning. And I, I he's 6-1, and one, right? I mean, not him, but the team is 6-1. and one. Right. And um, 
they're right there in the mix of it. So heck no, man. I want to beat the Giants. Shoot, why yeah. why would we change that right. up? And just hey, to I, give context for it, Red Zone is asking this because he's been beefing with a bunch of people who just hate Taylor Heineke, and he's <laughs> trying to say everyone like, "Calm down, you're just like irrationally hating the guy." So yeah, that's where yeah. his question. That's a good, okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good. Makes question. sense. Funny. Yeah. If you, th- I, I don't know why, when we were talking about us being six and one, it brought me back. We could, dude. The game before that against the Titans was when we almost won, and they ended up the goal line stand away. So really, we've been playing good football for the last eight games. Yeah. Which yes. Is, fantastic for us shout out to us yeah now i'm right there with you steve i i want to win I, I don't care who it is behind center i you know i love taylor heineke i've said many times he's shane falco uh he to a t you know the the guy mm-hmm. comes in disrespected ownership doesn't really want him it's not until they've put in the old vet guy does locker room doesn't really like him then he comes in to save the day i think uh he has a lot of shane falco to him where he doesn't blow you away with his intangibles but they just click as a team and so, yep. look, I let people talk, and they can say whatever the heck they want, but the fact is they're winning football games. I'm enjoying the ride. That's all I'm going to do. I just want more out of Taylor just so I don't have to hear this crap anymore, just so yeah. I don't have to see it constantly all the time, talking about we need a court. Like, okay, I get it, but can we just enjoy the game? Like, like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm too competitive <laughs> for my own good sometimes. So I would never want to just be like, oh, I want to lose so I can see the other guy come in. Like, you know, let's I get back to winning. 500. Then we can see if maybe Wentz can dig us out of this grave. <laughs> right. I mean, look, look, every, this past couple of weeks, the podcast has been happy. The fan base has, I mean, we complain about everything, but it's been less complaining about everything I, as of late. I stopped so, I mean, beating I, my dog. Dude, he, I'm just happier. He complained <laughs> about Taylor's beer that he was drinking on the plane. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> let's just, let's just keep up this ride and look. If people want to praise Jimmy G because all he does is win games and he makes it the NFC Championship, took his team to the Super Bowl, then why not Taylor? Like, obviously, Jimmy G is better than Taylor. But, I mean, look, all they do is win games. Taylor's cool. 10-4 and four in his last 14 starts for us as a starter. I mean, yep. when's the last time you can say that a quarterback, and at least that I've been alive, was 10-4 and four in 14 yeah. starts? So, look. Sure. I have my opinion. I wish – I want to see Taylor get to another level. I want to see him throw for – like at least 200 yards, that would be nice. But at the end of the day, if it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And they're winning games. And in NFL, all it comes down to is the win and loss column, and we're chalking up the wins. So yeah. it is what it is. That Gene Hackman quote in the replacements is he's talking to the reporter at the halftime at the end of the movie. It says, Heart, you know, heart, got to have heart. Right. Miles and miles and miles of heart. That's Taylor Heineke. Did you just watch the replacements lately? Because you No, like somebody uploaded the video. Somebody oh, uploaded okay. the video. No, I, I've been saying this for weeks that he's Shane know, Falco. I know, I know. Uh, yeah. Now, Steve, last question I have for you from another guy. Steve Andy, 42, I'm pretty sure in the UK. Oi! Thank you, Steve. What memorable play? No, by, Australian. Your no, most weird. memorable play by Sean Taylor. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness, man. That's tough. Um I, there's so many that Sean had. Obviously, a lot of people look at the Pro Bowl hit, which was great. But that's um, a like basic white girl Starbucks yeah. cappuccino. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. a pumpkin spice latte. For, Sean Taylor. Yeah. Plays. yeah. <laughs> For me, um, I would probably say the playoff clincher in Philly, um, yeah. where he took it, to, took it back to the house. Yeah. yeah, the dive. But man, there was so many. Sean was so special. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, it, he was just awesome. But yeah, that would that would probably because it was such a big moment. You know. Yeah. For me, it was against Dallas at home. Uh, they were kicking the field goal to win the game. Right. Yeah, the that face block mask. coming down, him grabbing the ball, and then I remember seeing him run, turn up field, and seeing his face mm-hmm. mask move just slightly. And I was screaming in the restaurant because I was I was a bus boy at this time, so I was at the bar when I wasn't supposed to, and I was watching the game. The Redskins are on. I'm watching, and yeah. so like screw you, I'm watching this. And so I was just like, oh go go, that's 15, that's 15, and like you couldn't see the numbers on the field from the TV, so it was like you were hoping they got in the field goal range, and that's like that that was Sean. The fact that they were yep. in a scoring position, about to kick a field goal, and he turned it into a scoring situation for us in an right. improbable situation. And that's Sean, man. That's mine. Yeah. Yep. That, uh, I mean, oh, go ahead, all, because I've, I've got a few I can name. Nah, yeah, I was going to I was gonna say the Eagles game. That's probably the uh, the most memorable one. I mean, but like you said, there's so many. Against yep. the Packers, what, he had like two interceptions or Against something Brett like that? Against Brett Favre. Or Favre, yeah. Brett interceptions. Favre, so. yep. <laughs> Those are yep. probably the two that stick out the most to me. The Eagles game and then picking off Brett Favre twice. Just yeah, yeah. I mean, you can go back to his first preseason game when I, yeah, right. against the Broncos. Yeah, he just the made the pick and yeah. people were like all the preseason hype and all the hype around him. So 
Yeah, yeah there was that man. man. Yeah, there was that. Uh, then there was a tackle. It was a, I think it was on the Monday Night Miracle. Yeah, where where he stopped. Uh, was it Joey Galloway? It was one of those guys short. Uh, as soon as they got the mm-hmm. when Dallas was driving again towards the end of the game, stopped him short on fourth down uh, against the Panthers when he oh, grabbed yeah, yeah, Muhammad's yeah. leg and, and pulled him down. But my biggest thing was watching Sean Taylor's rookie year highlight tape every all the time, and it was set to bad to the bone but it was the coolest thing in the world. And he had like blood coming out of his <laughs> mouthpiece and stuff. He was leveling the Steelers fullback. He was, he did a flip over when he sacked the bears quarterback back then. I don't remember what it was, but it was the tightest highlight tape of all time. Sean Taylor gets it. He does. Didn't he have a, a pro bowl yeah. hit against a punter or something like that? Also? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I I'll also so. <laughs> inject two more shots of that into my pumpkin spice latte into my veins because right. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody that's going to wrap us up for this episode thank you to everybody for your contributions uh your questions that you submitted thank you to sam 48 nick acreage and of course thank you to steve manila man i can't thank you enough you're one of the guys bro uh, i always Absolutely. appreciate your thoughts and we're, we're good luck steve so we got to continue this we had to replenish the the fuel the tube right we're got to go for Let's the stretch now now we got to plan this it. for the playoff game yeah absolutely mm-hmm. all right, appreciate boys. you guys man of course yeah man thank you we'll Always see you appreciate you brother all right everybody that's gonna wrap us up for this episode i'm kyle i am how and i'll take a sean taylor pro bowl uh hit hold the whipped cream <laughs> hold the whipped cream you're ridiculous Vintage all right everybody sucks. have a good weekend have a good week be safe and uh hopefully the team pulls off this victory this weekend i think this is uncharted territory and last thing I'll say before we get out of here, I feel like Taylor Heineke is a proven quarterback at this point in the NFL. I feel like everyone, even his supporters, are looking at him as still that kid off the couch. So anything he does is seen is great, and which is awesome that he is doing it. But I feel like he's proven himself. I feel like he belongs in the NFL. And I feel like his he definitely belongs in the NFL. Yeah. I do that. No, no matter how that is, he for sure belongs in the NFL. Yeah. All right, Chase Daniels in the NFL, he belongs. In the NFL. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if, if, if Nathan Joe Flacco Peterman is still in the NFL, Nathan Peterman's just started a game. Yeah. Come man, on. Man. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see you on later this week. I'm gonna be honest. I'm not sure if I will be here or not. I'm expecting. Oh, my, why? You're gonna have a kid. I'm expecting my <laughs> my daughter Corey to be uh, delivered this week. We're not exactly sure when. Uh, it's, we're kind of going to see what's going on with the health of it, the baby and everything like that. So. Podcast, baby. Come on, man. Priorities. Yeah, yeah, so, dude, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I'll be here on Friday, but I know that you guys will hold the, the pod quite well and you'll take care of it. Well, if do Katie uh, gives birth on Friday and we're going to be doing a, a podcast, maybe you should go to the hospital. Be there. <laughs> Don't be here. Be there. It's a hard decision. Hard decision. <laughs> know, All right, everybody. Enjoy the week. We'll see you again on Friday. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Woo!